Good morning. It's a great honor to be with all of you today, and especially with the ministers and the distinguished guests here and our, and our hosts. I really appreciate the invitation. And it's also a, a great honor to be here with, with the Swamiji, who's someone I've known for 35 uh, years and have appreciated his leadership for, for so long. You know, um, on the walls of, of my home at the U.S. Embassy, there are a number of inspiring uh, photographs on the wall that represent the relationship between India and the United States. But one of my favorites is depicted here, and that is the one of President Kennedy meeting Prime Minister Nehru in 1961. Uh, and I think some of you may know that three days before this historic meeting, President Kennedy had created the United States Agency for International Development. Now his vision was to create an organization that would tackle some of the world's greatest development challenges. But he also recognized that addressing poverty could be even more difficult than putting a man on the moon. Now, we are fortunate to have a short video that includes some of President Kennedy's remarks about the challenges we faced then. And I think you'll find that many of these challenges are with us today. Today, we seek to move beyond the accomplishments of the past to establish the principle that all the people are entitled to a decent way of life. This is the most demanding goal of all. We have made a good start on our journey, but we have still a long way to go. The conquest of poverty is as difficult, if not more difficult, than the conquest of outer space. And we can expect moments of frustration and disappointment. But we have no doubt about the outcome. For all history shows that the effort to win progress represents the most determined and steadfast aspirations of man. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Now, in the last uh, several months, a new Indian prime minister has met another American president. Uh, twice, and their meetings underscored the global benefits our growing partnership can bring about. Now, it is a partnership that has evolved through the years from one rooted in strategic priorities to one that is now driven by innovation, by knowledge, by creativity, and by the drives of our peoples. So just as the U.S.-India relationship has evolved, so has the way we address development challenges, the way we address them together. So in the 60s, we worked together to achieve food security during the Green Revolution. And today, our approach is defined by partnerships. Partnerships not only between our governments, but partnerships between governments and innovators, social entrepreneurs that impact investors like all of you. Partnerships that are focused on solutions in areas like health, energy, food security. They are focused on solutions that can be tested locally, scaled to larger objectives, and exported. So let me give you an example. So our development partnerships include triangular assistance. India, the United States, and our partners now work together to assist developing countries in Asia and Africa 
as they address their own development challenges. Triangular efforts showcase Indian leadership and know-how while contributing to stability and prosperity. For example, USAID is partnering with Shristi, the Society for Research and Initiatives for Sustainable Technologies and Institutions, and Tata Agrico to promote food security in Kenya through the transfer of affordable, innovative Indian farm and food processing machinery. One example of their work is a motorbike-based tractor-trailer tiller that Shristi developed and then adapted to local needs. This tractor trailer helped increase agricultural productivity and improve the resilience of vulnerable communities and households. And innovations like these hold great promise for African development. On water, which is such a big issue, and I know that Swamiji has had such a, a big leadership role on, we're also working with many partners on improving water and sanitation conditions. You know, globally, I think most of you know, 2.5 billion people lack access to improved sanitation, and 780 million people still do not have access to safe drinking water. And lack of access to clean water and sanitation in urban areas is a direct contributor to hundreds of thousands of child deaths annually, as well as many other preventable diseases. And according to the 2011 census, right here in India, there are 65 million Indians living in urban informal or slum settlements with inadequate access to safe water and sanitation services. Now the US government is partnering with India's Ministry of Urban Development, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and leading Indian and multinational corporates to support Prime Minister Modi's Swachh Bharat Clean India campaign which aims to provide clean water and sanitation services to all. In Bangalore, for example, we're working with the city administration and Water Health India to provide over 32,000 households with clean drinking water. Prior to this effort, slum residents often became ill from contaminated water or paid high prices for commercial water. Now, with support from USAID and the local municipal corporation, Water Health has built purification centers in the community that produce water that meets WHO standards for safe drinking water. And local residents now have access to clean and safe drinking water at a sustainable low cost. And on health, India has made impressive progress in the health sector over the past two decades. Notably, it has reduced maternal and child mortality rates by more than half, more than half. And USAID is helping to build on this progress by working with DASRA, the Paramal Foundation, Kiowa Trust, to bring together philanthropists and social entrepreneurs in an effort to save the lives of one million more adolescent girls, mothers, and children. Programs like these put the goal of ending preventable child and maternal deaths within reach. And on clean energy, we are also working together in novel ways to balance growing energy needs within the realities of climate change. Introducing renewable energies into people's lives in a way that also builds incomes and empowers people is a way to find this balance. For instance, a program called the Partnership on Women's Entrepreneurship in Clean Energy, or W Power, is a good example of how India and the United States are partnering with innovators like you to change lives. W Power teaches women entrepreneurs about small renewable energy products that can be used in the home. These women then go out and sell the products to their peers, increasing their incomes, building skills, and introducing renewable energy into their communities. One such entrepreneur, Shanta Gawali, is, is here. Ms. Gawali lives with her husband in a village in Maharashtra. They have a small farm, and for years, she supplemented their modest farming income with a home-based business producing and packaging snacks. W Power helped Ms. Gawali expand her product line and her income by introducing renewable energy devices like clean cook stoves and solar lamps into her product line. Ms. Gawali's story has been replicated hundreds of times in Maharashtra and Bihar using road shows, weekly market stalls, and on-the-spot demonstrations. These entrepreneurs reached 350,000 people and sold 80,000 products. Now last week, I saw another example of how renewable energy solutions can change lives. And I was in Mysore and visited a migrant slum community where many of the adults make cricket bats. 
And as I'm sure you can imagine, this nomadic community is far off the energy grid. But because of a partnership between USAID and Celco, many families now own portable, battery-operated solar energy units that produce electricity to power a light and charge a mobile phone. And the introduction of these mini power plants into this community, community is changing lives. The lights now allow the workers to increase the number of bats they can make, increasing their incomes by up to 30%, but the use of kerosene is decreasing in favor of clean solar power. But these are just the tangible benefits. There are other benefits. As one of the workers told me, the solar lights were also reducing his family's exposure to snakes, to rodents, and insects, making his wife and children feel safer. So when thinking about the impact of our development efforts, we cannot discount secondary benefits like these. The resilience and social fabric of this community is being strengthened because these families feel safer and more economically empowered. Now, I started with President Kennedy, and I'll end with President Obama. At Siri Fort in January, President Obama emphasized the importance of recognizing that everyone's dreams, whether a cleaner, whether a rickshaw driver, or a little girl carrying water, everyone's dreams are important and beautiful. And it's up to us, all of us, the people who are fortunate enough to live lives in countries where the grandson of a cook can become the president and the son of a tea seller, tea seller can become the prime minister. It's up to all of us to find ways to help people turn those dreams into reality. We can do so by continuing to develop, to innovate, and to partner together. You know, as President Kennedy said at the outset, We've made a good start on our journey, but we do have a long way yet to go. But I do applaud all of your efforts for your continuing hard work towards fostering innovation for impact. I look forward to meeting and working with many of you in the future. And again, I thank all of you for all that you're doing each day. Thank you very much.